The other thing a leader has to have is empathy, right? They have to understand where you're coming from and not be, you know, that's how you can go offline and sometimes coaches can become too demanding. And listen, each one of those two categories has 25 things that we could talk about, but those are the two big things, discipline and empathy. So when our coaches have it, then all of a sudden our volunteers feel it, and the volunteers are a critical part of our program delivery, then our athletes feel it, and then all of a sudden you're building a peer network, and we're creating leaders out of our young athletes. It's, it's awesome, and that's really, when we talk about the impact beyond the field, I think that's hopefully a byproduct of our work done well. Welcome to America's Healthiest City. I am your host, Will Melton, and today we have the CEO of Sportable Hunter, Lehman. I'm excited to bring Hunter onto the show, but before we get started, if you've never tuned into this show before, please check out americashealthiestcity.com to learn about our 10-year community partnership to make the entire region the healthiest in America by 2033. Uh, we've done a research. We know what we're doing. We need to bring everybody along in this journey. If you represent an academic institution, a for-profit business, a nonprofit entity, or a government agency, and you want to jump on board, uh, we're looking for ambassadors who will help us spread the word and inject ideas into this 10-year initiative. So, um, without further ado, Hunter, welcome to the show. Thanks hey, so much for coming thank, on. Thank you for having me. This is great. Yeah, well, we're excited to talk with you. Um, you are playing a big role in the health of the region, and we want to make sure that folks know about that, and uh, and we want to learn some lessons from you as well. So, uh, I'm going to start this off by just asking the same question I ask everybody. How did you uh, find yourself in Richmond? Oh, in Richmond. Um, grew up in a very uh, small rural community, Brunswick County, still still hard, hard as in Brunswick. And the uh, <clears throat> most important thing to me as a 17-year-old young man was being able to play college baseball. And that's how I ended up at Randolph-Macon, which I affectionately call Harvard of the South. Um, <clears throat> and was there, was very involved in the Randolph-Macon community, but also really got involved in the Richmond community. Um, was lucky enough, interned at the General Assembly, got to know a lot of what the city had to offer, fell in love with it. And even when my professional career took me outside of the city, I always had a desire to come back. And I've been back in this community uh, since 2004. Wow. I, yeah. I was here for a semester in 2003 <laughs> and uh, I moved back in 2017. So uh, you've got me beat by a number of years. Well, I think you have to be here seven or eight generations to be a local. I think that is slowly changing. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, it is, uh, it is my wife and family. We, it, it's home for us. Great. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I want to start off by kind of digging into your personal background. Um, uh, so, so we'll talk a little bit more about Sportable here in a minute. But you know, you're in, in the world of sports. You're in the world of sports you know, management. You're in the world of of, uh, of connecting people to sports. Um, tell us a little bit about how you got into this profession, and um, you know, t you take as much time as you you would like to kind of give us that arc. Sure. Well, you know, I, I mentioned that baseball was a very important component to my life when I was younger. Um, when I graduated from Randolph-Macon, I, I kind of accidentally fell into the commercial commercial real estate world and was very fortunate to work for some really great companies. And I um, found myself in Raleigh-Durham. I wanted to be there. I kind of targeted that market, found some alum that had some job titles that sounded like they had some influence and authority. And I went down and met someone and made up a bunch of things about liking dirt and doors. And the next thing you know, I had a job in real estate. And uh, the gentleman that I worked for, we had... And this was right after, this is 99, so I'm still in school, mm -hmm. right? And I'm finishing up school, but the dot-com bubble comes, and all of a sudden liquidity dries up, and we have liquidity. We have we had institutional investors that were already kind of in-house. So the job was great. I didn't think I was going to do it for very long, but I ended up staying with him for five years. Moved to California and did that. We were in the San Francisco market for a while, which is where my then-girlfriend and I were, and then we moved here, like I said, in 04 was lucky enough to work for the Tallheimer Group, which is still a big big group here in Richmond, have a great investment team, and I did that. But there was always something m missing, you know? I, and I never really could put my finger on it. Um, but the more kind of inflection I did and the more kind of personal discovery, um, there's a book by Poe po Bronson called What Should I Do With My Life? And then there's also uh, What Color Is My Parachute? I think I read three of those editions. But I, I did a lot of work and realized that I really missed sports. I really did. And so, unbeknownst to me at the time, uh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University has a great sports leadership program, and it's called the Center for Sport Leadership, which is now in the School of Business at VCU. And so I found myself there. It was 2008, so if you remember those times, it was, um, 
it was pretty dark from an economic standpoint. It was probably a pretty good time to go back to grad school. Probably a good time to be out of the real estate business, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Although I will say my friends at Tolheimer did really well. Um, but yeah, it was a good time for to get out. I go back to grad school. I'm convinced at that point that it, if you'll remember, right, I, I really thought Chicago was going to get the Olympics. We sent over Obama. We sent over Oprah. We were in the competition for what ended up being the Rio Games. And Chicago was the first city eliminated. I couldn't believe it. And that really put a big damper on my plans. Um, but I'd had an informational interview with Rob Ucrop, who was very influential in the Richmond Kickers Soccer Club. Next thing I know, I'm director of sales for the Kickers. I was there for five years. During that time, I had done some volunteer work for Sportable. And I didn't know anything about disability. I didn't know anything about disability etiquette. I certainly didn't know about adaptive sports. But I wanted to give back. I kind of got connected to the organization to a guy by the name of Mark Grossman. The next thing you know, I'm coaching their power wheelchair soccer team. I know nothing about power wheelchair soccer, but I had a lot of enthusiasm. I had a whistle, and I had a desire to want to coach and teach. And so I, I enjoyed the experience and did that for, for five seasons, almost five years. And I, and I ended up integrating professional kicker soccer players into it as well. It was great. And... Um, and anyway, by the end, you knew how to play soccer, too. Well, I, I could certainly <laughs> talk it. I could certainly talk it. For a long time, I was made fun of as the guy on the staff that was the baseball guy that was parading as a soccer It's like Ted Lasso, player. basically. Exactly. <laughs> and it's funny, because I was always always at the Pete Rose haircut, but when you start working for a soccer company, they really don't... This was part of the look. So my wife liked it, so it just kind of... You know, it's kind of how it started. And um, anyway, when the opportunity came to join Sportable in a professional capacity in 2014... I, I jumped. I took the leap, and, and that was that was actually nine years ago this month. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. It's been great. And, and did you come into leadership you know, at that point? I did. I did. I started um, as the executive director. Kristen Lessick, who is, who is now since uh, remarried, but Kristen was the founder of the organization. She asked me if I was interested in taking her spot because she had to leave, and I said no. But Richmond is the world's largest small town. I've always thought we were two degrees from anyone, right? Kevin Bacon was full of crap. No, we, we're, we're tight, right? I said, let's have coffee. We'll find, we can find someone together that might be interested in this. Mm -hmm. Well, 20 minutes turned into two hours, and here I am. And I came on as the executive director. There were three of us, and it was a relatively small group. But we've grown. Kristen did a great job of putting in the infrastructure and really had the vision to see the need for the work and the mission. And it's just, it's been a, it's been a great ride, man. It's been a great ride. So you're now the CEO. Yep. Uh, yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about um, what your work entails today. Oh man, work entails. Uh, you know, as the life of an entrepreneur, and I think we, you know, we've talked about this before. I don't know that it ever turns off, right? There's no such thing as a nine to five day or even every day being the same. As we've grown, I've gotten really lucky. We've got a great staff and they're much better at program delivery than I ever was. So we're a much better organization today than we were. But really my job entails being a cheerleader being out in the community, talking to, to local corporations and, and local business leaders and people of influence, and influence, letting them know about our work and then seeing what they can do to hopefully strengthen it and, and kind of expand our reach, if you will. And then there's a certain part of my work that is strategic and thinking about the future and how to best position the organization. And then there's the nuts and bolts of operation. My team will tell you though, they try to keep me away from that work as, as much as they can. And they try to keep me focused on being a cheerleader. And listen, it's easy to do. Um, you know, we have 16 sports. We have 25 programs. Our youngest athlete is three. Our oldest athlete is 87. And it's, it's a wide variety of people that we touch. And we do it through sports. But I feel like the impact of what we do goes well beyond a court or a playing field. It's, it's, it's much more about building community than I think it is sports. So I want to talk about that. Last week we had Dr. Chris Reyna, uh, the uh, Executive Director for the Institute of Transformative Leadership at VCU in hmm. the studio. Uh, and I know that, um, you know, there's, he actually talked about sports. He talked about the fact that in sports, you know, you don't see an elite athlete that doesn't have a coach that they work with hours mm -hmm. a day. So, you know, leadership shouldn't be any different. I know that through your work, leadership is a big part of, of what you do as an individual, but it's also a big part of what Sportable does. So can we talk a little bit about um, what's the relationship in your mind between sports and, and leadership development? Oh, wow. Well, it, um, is it Lou? I think it's Lou Holtz. Lou Holtz has a great, has a great line. I don't know if I a hundred percent believe it, but it's good. It's, it's sports doesn't build character. It reveals it. And so sometimes, you know, sports is great because it puts you in a position where you, and, and listen, I'll say this cause I say this to a lot of folks. 
you know, if you're a, a, a sport fan, if you consume mass sports, and if you're consuming kind of the major sport leagues or college sports, a lot of times you can be very disenchanted with what's happening. Uh, economics plays a much bigger picture in sports. We've got athletes that hold out frequently. The entire college system has been blown up really over money, and it's all about television revenue and whatnot. One of the reasons I love my job so much is that it gets down to the true aspects of why sport is so great. It's about being part of something that's bigger than yourself, right? It's about we more than me. It's about relying on others. It's about being part of something and pulling together towards a common goal that you can't do it by yourself, but you can do it with a group of people. And even if you're an individual athlete, even if you're a tennis player or if you're in track and field and you're a sprinter, there's still a community of people that are helping you to get to reach your ultimate goal. And I love that. It creates accountability, and it, it creates a lot of the attributes, I think, in terms of leadership that corporations and really our greater community look for in terms of people of influence and our leaders. So I think sports builds that. So Sportable, and, and I'll think about it and talk about it just in terms of our programs, right? Our best sports, without question, have the best coaches. You have the best leaders. And that doesn't mean that they're out trying to win national ch titles, right? And there are programs that want to do that. But are they holding people accountable? Are they creating a good community where there's peer support? It's, they're too great, and, and I think this is true in business too, but it's a lot easier for us to see it in sports. There's two great things that all coaches have. Number one is discipline, okay? They hold you, you have expectations. And you have expectations not only for yourself, but for your teammates and everyone that has put on their resources to make you better, right? So there's discipline to make sure that you honor those resources and you continue to strive the best at all times. The other thing that a leader has to have is empathy. Right? They have to understand where you're coming from and not be, you know, that's how you can go offline and sometimes coaches can become too demanding. And listen, each one of those two categories has 25 things that we could talk about, but those are the two big things, discipline and empathy. So when our coaches have it, then all of a sudden our volunteers feel it, and the volunteers are a critical part of our program delivery, then our athletes feel it, and then all of a sudden you're building a peer network and we're creating leaders out of our young athletes. It's, it's awesome. And that's really, when we talk about the impact beyond the field, I think that's Hopefully a byproduct of our work done well. You know, we'll talk more about ripple effects here in a minute. You're listening to America's Healthiest City on ESPN Richmond 106.1, part of the Mike King Biz Media Network. Uh, we are airing every Thursday at 6 a.m. Uh, here on ESPN. Uh, we have today Hunter Lehman, CEO of Sportable, and uh, we're talking about the ripple uh, effect of leadership. Um, you know, this is such a wonderful uh, thing to talk about because, you know, what we're doing here with the show and what we're doing with this this program, America's Healthiest City, is mm -hmm. uh, you know trying to inject leadership, but but helping other folks know that it's not going to be up to us. It's up to leadership across the board to make this happen. So, um, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about uh, Sportable's mission, sure, uh, and and dive a little bit deeper into the operations and how people plug into your organization. Sure. So, Sportable has been around since two thousand and five. So we're we're in our nineteenth, or I guess we're. We're getting close to our 20th year anniversary, and it's evolved over time, but our mission has always been consistent, right? So our, our work has evolved, the organization has evolved, it's changed and grown. But our mission is to transform lives, is to create opportunities and transform lives of those with physical disabilities and visual impairment through sport. That's always been the mission, that's been the work, right? Now it's funny, you're probably familiar with this just based on our conversations in the past. Simon Sinek has this wonderful video. It's, I joke and tell my team, it's probably the first video that was ever put on the web. It's a little grainy, <laughs> but it's the power of why, yeah. right? Yeah. And our why, Sportable's why is community. That's our why. How we do it is through adaptive sport, right? And it's interesting, If following, it, and I was so intrigued and so thankful you asked me to be here. When we talk about health and wellness and we talk about the healthy profile of a community, the Surgeon General put out a report earlier this year and it talks about one of the biggest pitfalls in terms of our community health profile and it's social isolation. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the biggest brand pillars we have is that our community tends to be very socially isolated. And so part of the, I would say a big part of the deliverable of our work is breaking down those barriers and connecting our athletes with the greater community around them. There was a great quote, I used to use this all the time, or I should say a great stat. It was pre-COVID, right, so it's a little dated, I'm not sure. Um, it's probably ebbed and flowed as it does with like employment trends, but the average employment rate for a chair user is 18%. But if that chair user plays adaptive sports, it's 56%. And I got that from the Challenge Athletes Foundation. Now what comes first, chicken or egg? I don't know. But I will tell you that being part of a program and being part of a community of peers where there's accountability increases your self-confidence, it increases your community engagement, and it just makes you 
it, the holistic part of the health and wellness profile of playing in sports and being part of a community really raises it beyond just the, the things that we talk about, which is better weight, better stamina, and some of those things. I feel like our work is really important, and, and again, excited to be here. I think Richmond considers itself a sports town, mm -hmm. and I think we consider ourselves a town that is very focused and cares a lot about health and wellness. Our responsibility is making sure that, hey, that's true for every one of our citizens. Everyone should have a seat at that table. And so the population we represent, we want to make sure that we're part of those discussions and part of those outcomes. There was an article in the RTD uh, just a few days ago that talked about the spike in uh, self-neglect cases mm -hmm. that social services is going out, uh, you know, largely with older adults. Mm -hmm. um, and so we know that this isolation issue is a problem. We know that it particularly affects men. Uh, mm -hmm. As they age, uh, the more they're isolated, the more they, they you know, suffer and die early. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit more about um, you know, how you guys do outreach in the community and, and, and welcome uh, new folks uh, into your world. Sure. It, and so we're very lucky. I think we, we determined years ago that we could only go as far as our partners could go, right? Like we can't, if we had billions of dollars in the bank, we could probably be a little bit more rambunctious mm -hmm. and do what we wanted. We don't have that yet, but if you have a checkbook, I'd love to talk to you after mm -hmm. this is over. Um, but so we rely a lot on the support of our partners. So in terms of referrals and trying to source folks, we talk to our friends at VCU, particularly at the Children's Hospital. Sheltering Arms Institute is a great partner. The Parks and Rec Services, in all of, in, not only in the city, but in the surrounding municipalities, they're great feeders for us. Because we bring a certain skill set that allows them to serve more of their residents and, and provides a real value add for those communities. I think, though, in terms of a lot of the social change and a lot of the more focus on DEI, it's been an interesting conversation for us internally the last few years, whereas we had blind spots and we needed to acknowledge those and figure out how to get better, but we also had to plant the flag for those with disabilities to say, hey, that we need a seat at that table too. So we have been a lot more intentional about saying, hey, where are the underserved communities? What are the barriers to participation on those communities and how can we better go about serving those communities? And not going in with the assumption that we know what the issue is. That's, that, that's not a, a solution in any way, shape, or form. So when we think about outreach, we talk about the low-hanging fruit, which are the medical providers, the schools, the parks and recs. But then also, we're trying to be a lot more intentional about identifying places that we think need our, need our services, need our programming, and then trying to figure out the best way to go about serving those communities. We hired a community engagement coordinator. Uh, David has been on our team. We hired him in the middle of the summer to fulfill a grant where we're talking about doing more of that work. And so we're just getting started, but I'm really excited where the possibilities are going to take us. Tell me about all the different uh, sports that you guys are oh, involved in. I should have bought a list. Um, let's see. You guys right. doing pickleball yet? We are doing pickleball. <laughs> I very reluctantly agreed to do a pickleball program about a year and a half ago. There's a wait list, and there's adaptive pickleball, and it's actually a really great sport in terms of combining those able-bodied and those with different abilities together, it's its pretty awesome. Um, so yes, we have pickleball. Uh, we have tennis, we have wheelchair tennis. We host one of the largest wheelchair tennis tournaments in the country every year here in June. Um, we have a rugby program, we have kayaking, we have rowing, we have lacrosse. Uh, we have a, um, a road racing program that supports our 10K, um, 10, 10K and the marathon races. We have an archery program. Um, we have rock climbing that we do in conjunction with other partners. We also have a wheelchair basketball program, and I'm excited. I'm, we're telling everybody we can, right, that right here in Richmond, we are hosting the National Wheelchair Basketball Championships next spring. Next April, the first two weekends of April, there'll be over 1,100 chair users from all over the country. And I'm talking about Paralympians, high-level athletes that will be at the new center. Our friends at the Henrico Sports and Entertainment Authority are building that facility at Virginia Center mm -hmm. Commons. We're going to be one of the first big events there and we're going to have the championships there. They'll be there for two years. It's a great opportunity for our region to showcase just how inclusive we are and how sports is something for everyone in every population. We're, we're, we're really excited about that opportunity, not only for sportable, but for the region next year. Well, I'm glad you said something about Henrico County because um, I can only imagine uh, the impact that the growth of the sporting facilities here in this region are having on organizations like yours. What do you see, um, what's possible uh, as we go into the future that maybe we wouldn't uh, be able to do before? Oh, gosh. Um, or maybe well, what's, what's another you know couple of events that you, you see coming come here as a result? Well, I'll tell you this. I think one of our big organizational strengths, not to get too much in the weeds, but I feel like our team, we do a very good job of executing events, right? And I think that's twofold, right? We have a really good team to do it. We understand kind of where the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, right? 
but there's also a really supportive community that supports it, not only in terms of sponsorship dollars and, and support dollars, but that come out, that provide volunteer support, that give up their time, energy, talent, everything to, to elevate those programs. And for years, especially in the adaptive sports world, a lot of times those events got pushed into free facilities that were in a bad part of town that weren't accessible and we didn't necessarily get top draw, right? And so I think about it. My son's 13. We pay a ridiculous amount for him to play power or um, to play travel soccer. We travel all over the Mid-Atlantic to play in these tournaments, right? I'm not going to say it's a rite of passage, but it's, it's a great development tool for him. Our thought has always been our athletes are just deserving of every opportunity that everybody else has. And I will say with the explosion of all these facilities and with the emphasis on sports tourism, it's a chance for us to be a real center of adaptive sports and Paralympic sports right here. Because we do it well, our community supports it. You know, so right now, so we host one of the largest wheelchair tennis tournaments. We have the nationals coming here for basketball. We hosted a wheelchair rugby tournament here over the summer, and we've been approached potentially to be able to host larger tournaments for that association. Um, there's lacrosse tournaments that could be here. There's CP Soccer, which is a young program that it's growing in terms of its footprint all over the nation. We think it's a great opportunity, again, just like nationals, not only for our organization, but for our region to be a sports destination for every ability. Thank you for listening to America's Healthiest City on Mike King Biz Radio Network. All right, uh, we are here with Hunter Lehman, the CEO of Sportable. And uh, just uh, so you guys know, if you haven't been to americashealthycity.com, I want you to go over and check out the ideas board. That's a place where anybody in the community can leave their ideas, comment on ideas uh, so that we can make them better. And, uh, and just plug in to the folks who are actually making things happen. Uh, there's some ideas there that are actively being pursued in the community, and then there's some things that we could probably tap into, like maybe uh, injecting some AI into our traffic lights so we can sit less at the stoplight and emit less CO2. So that's just one. Um, I vote for that. I vote for that <laughs> right here. I vote. Who, who's going to say no? Um, so I'm going to prime you for a question I'm going to ask you later because I don't think I told you, but we usually ask folks, you know, somebody in the community that you look up to that you think we should bring onto the show. But before we do, you know, I want to give people uh, an opportunity to uh, hear your ideas for our ideas board on ways that either individuals or groups or uh, organizations here in, in the region can contribute to, you know, this mission of, uh, of, you know, first believing that we can do this, but then, you know, how do we get there? Oh, gosh, that's a loaded question. Um, I think about it. Okay, so here's the thing, right, Mike? my life is kind of divided into three buckets. Those buckets are those buckets are work, their family, and me, right, if you will. And so me can be defined in many ways. But one of the things that drives me personally is I, I love cycling. I love biking. It's like one of my favorite things. And I think about the legacy of what UCI was back in 2015, and there was tons of work done before UCI, right? But one of the great legacies of UCI is, and it's been the work of a lot of folks, but I, our region is much more in tune to bicycle infrastructure and moving people around. And I see more kids that are actually biking to school and people that are using it for their everyday modes of transportation. I feel like if we can be more intentional about being more active in our daily pursuits, like it's not just exercise. Exercise is super important, right? But what can we do beyond exercise to make it more part of our daily routine? I don't know. Like I, I feel like that is something that could really change the well, like health outcome profiles, and not three years down the road, but 10, 15, 20 years down the road, changing those behaviors can be really helpful. And so that's public policy, right? That's infrastructure, that's bike lanes. You know, for our population, we're talking about accessible sidewalks, we're talking about accessible parking, um, we're talking about access to amenities like parks and trails and the like. And I, I'm excited that we're doing that work and more of that work is happening, but that's probably the biggest I don't want to say low-hanging fruit because I mean, it needs a lot of work, but I mean, I, I feel like that's probably one of the biggest returns on investments we could have as a healthy community. I, I think. Yeah. Well, what about um, you know other organizations that you guys are working with to to make things happen? I know that you can't do it alone. I know you rely on a lot of individuals, but what are some of the partnerships that you guys are tapped into, and how do those things have an impact? Well, lots of really great partnerships. I've mentioned the counties and the city. The parks and rec departments are great, right? Just because there's a real synergy in terms of being able to provide programming, making people more active, and us having the skill set to be able to help more populations. That's a great one. Our friends at the Sheltering Arms Institute, mm -hmm. right, so that's a rehabilitation hospital right here, new to the market, 
we provide a great service. We're part of what they call the continuum of care, and I love that, right? Because your care doesn't just leave when you leave the hospital. It, it's ongoing. And we're part of that care network, which is awesome. Um, VCU is great, and it's not just the VCU Children's Hospital and the, and the hospital network. Their whole collection, their whole community of great drivers of our resource engine, which is athletes, athlete referrals, volunteers, coaches, like that's just been a great community for us. And then the corporate community, like I, I think about Dominion, I think about Markel, I think about CarMax. I mean, those are just an example of local organizations that really have invested in their community and helped make our work possible, but other organizations as well, right? So those are all people that are part of our research resource engine. There are other organizations that do work that are in our space. I think about Beyond Boundaries. I think about Jacob's Chance. I think about the work on the policy side that John and his team over the sports backers are doing to make mm -hmm. our community more accessible. There's, there's lots of groups out there that are doing good work that I think not only enhances our mission, but other folks in health and wellness. So before we get to my, my last question, um, what, are, um, what are some things that you guys are looking for right now? What are some needs that you have that, that you can share? Well, I think we really have this tremendous opportunity with these national championships coming, mm -hmm. right? So we're pounding the pavement nail. <laughs> Excuse me, we're, we're looking for sponsors, right? We're trying to find people that will want to support financially the, the, the event. But not only that, we're going to need, we think, potentially as many as 1,000 volunteers over the 10-day period. So we're looking for volunteer engagement. Um, we're looking for people that just want to put their best foot forward. Like We think it's an opportunity for our region really to roll out the red carpet and talk about how accessible we are, not just as a facility or as a standalone event, but just in terms of what the entire community can be. So that's really important for us. And then here's the other thing. We're always looking for people that can be potential athletes. And it's chair users, it's amputees, it's those with visual impairments. But here's the thing, there's no disability profile that is the same. And so a lot of times, if we can't serve the individual directly, we know of resources in the community where they can be served. So we encourage anyone, if you need an accommodation to play sport or recreate, think of sport, reach out, see how we can help. And uh, t tell me the date of that event again. So we, we it's, the, it's the first two weekends of, of April. God, I should know. No, that's okay. That, that's good enough. Is that good enough? We, we've got first, plenty of good, time good, to promote. Good, good. Yeah. First two weekends. Uh, of my, my my friends from the business school would say we're a little bit too early to start promoting that. So. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Never yeah. too early in your world. Never sure. too early. So um, who's somebody? If, if you could think of one person that we definitely need to get on this show so that we can tell their story and and, and allow them to share their ideas. Who who's somebody that is a beacon in your world. I will tell you, and I don't talk to this gentleman a lot. I probably talk to him a couple times a year, but I had the luxury of working for him, and I just think his legacy in terms of health and wellness is huge. Bobby Ucrop. I don't know if Bobby's been on this show, but Bobby yeah. Bobby was one of the, the people that made Richmond Sports Packers a reality. He has constantly put time, talent, and treasure, like everything he can in terms of making us a healthier community. And he's done it through swimming, he's done it through golf, He's done it through his support of soccer and community organizations. Like, in my mind, Bobby is, you know, he's on the Mount Rushmore of health and wellness for this area, and he would be, and, and you know, I think I'm high energy. Every time I hang out with Bobby, I'm like, I don't know how he does it. It's, it's incredible. He is, he never stops. Well, I'm going to admit something I'm, I'm embarrassed about, but uh, I went to my first kicker's game this season, and oh. uh, I, I navigated accidentally to the, the kicker's office, which is in the Ucrops <laughs> building, and I said, I don't think I'm in the right place, but it started to click for me, uh, you know, how the kickers came to be and, and yeah. you know, how, how uh, critical he's been in, in making that happen. And I will say shamelessly, um, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, in getting Richmond water in the kickers, so maybe there's uh, an opportunity <laughs> there. <laughs> um, so uh, please tell folks uh, how they can find you out there online. Listen, best way is uh, uh, sportable.org. It's our website, but I will say that, so I'm, I'm the old man in the office. I'm not as great with social media, but we, my team does a great job with all of our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube, and it's generally Sportable RVA in terms of our handle. It's We're easy to find. You should check us out, and we're always looking for ambassadors, people that understand or know our work. So we, we, we appreciate all the, all the interest in the work we do. Well, thank you. Thank you. This has been America's Healthiest City on ESPN Richmond 106.1. Please join me next week at on Thursday at 6 a.m., uh, part of the Mike King Biz Media Network. We're excited to be here. Hunter, thanks for coming on with us today. This is a really great conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, man.